Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, it's a great day and uh, beginning of a new month. And we had rain in the spring. And it's a new quarter. And lesson one, the creation is what a way to start. Back to the beginning. Indeed it is. Let's, Let's start with prayer. Definitely. Father, thank you so much. It's a beautiful day and we're so thankful that you have created the Sabbath, that you've given us an opportunity to, to read your word. And today we ask that you uh, send your spirit to guide our minds and our words so that the lessons that you have um, come through so that we can share the knowledge and the, the look at your creation and what you want us to understand. For we pray in your name. Amen. Well, we have a very short lesson, uh, memory verse to start with, that I'm sure we all know. Genesis, Genesis 1, 1, 1. In, in the, the beginning, beginning, God created, created the heavens and, and the earth. earth. You it, know, it sets the tone for the entire <laughs> rest of the chapters. And I found it interesting that the lesson I'd never thought about, how it takes on two different approaches in Genesis, not approaches, but creation parts, so to speak, in Genesis 1 and 2. And so as we look at this, we're going to look not only at Genesis, but um, some of the other parts of the Bible that, that relate to uh, the topics of creation. Uh, this won't be a creation, a creation study that is, and what did we get on the first day? And what did we get on the second day? It won't be that. So put your no, belts not away the days of the, and of come the creation back. week. That's true. Yeah, um, um, we're going to look at uh, the concept of um, what it has to say about history. So many times we don't think about creation being the history of the world. Hmm. His story. Yes, indeed. Um, but there's a lot of things that are acknowledged in Genesis that uh, play a role in understanding uh, the beginning of history. The authors of our lesson deal quite a bit with the original Hebrew words and their meanings, which we will definitely an, look at. Well, being an English-speaking country, we don't look at Hebrew very often, but it's important because of the subtle meanings and differences that these words have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we look at Genesis 1 and 2 in particular, this, uh, this week's for this study, it talks, of course, about truly the creative God mm -hmm. and his relation to, hu to humanity, his creatures. The most important biblical start is the beginning, the beginnings of the lesson. And I loved how our author said a lesson on grace. Well, you know, just the whole concept of creation and what God wanted to do, the purpose behind He's a, he's a creative God. He loves to create. He has every intention of creating amazing things for us to enjoy. But more than that, it's the fact that uh, why did he do it? What prompted him? And the concept of grace, sometimes we get it as forgiveness of sins. But grace is far bigger than that. It is a far bigger word than that. And so... Looking at what went into that, the plan of redemption um, with this world, that there was already a plan in place, already something that he had done to uh, allow for this, this big expansion of, of his world, his universes, and what he, he wanted for us to see. His, his galaxies. Galaxies. We, don't, we think there's only one universe, but maybe there are more universes. Yeah, we, just we don't know. Our, know. our knowledge is so limited. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until recently that the thought dawned on me that God probably continued to create new planets and new creatures after Earth and humans. We were a unique creation. And, well, I should say we were. We are a unique creation in the universe. We're in told His that, image. We're told that in, in, spirit of, in the spirit of prophecy. And... Just the fact that our creation in and of itself also was redemption. And this too, both gifts, creation and redemption, a gift. And they all point to the final day of creation. But I'm, maybe I'm getting a little bit of ahead of our, ourselves in the lesson. But creation and redemption both deal with Sabbath. So let's continue on. We kind of looked at the lesson in, in its entirety in, in its 
bigness, so to speak, is what we often do on Sabbath day study anyway, the, the overall point of the lesson. Sunday jumps right in to who this being is, the God of creation. Yeah. The God of creation. And um, Cindy's lesson looks at Psalms 100. So, you know, I, I was thinking about Psalms 100. Psalm I know Psalms 100. 100. Um, we look at it and it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Um, know that the Lord is God, that he has made us, and we are not, he is, it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Um, we are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast mercy endures forever and ever. Of course, the lesson stops and before Tracy. his faithfulness. And less, the first three of that is the key point of Sunday's lesson. God made us. We didn't make ourselves. And that's yes. an important part. But Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Herein is where the Hebrew plays a very significant part for our meaning and understanding of this, which we don't have in, create, in, in English because of how the literature is in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And the lesson points out that the word God is placed right in the middle of the verse, underlining it as the strongest accent in the Hebrew uh, liturgical traditional chanting that gives the importance to God or whatever word is in that position and that's the well, part that's, in Genesis 1 1 it's God that's what well, we're looking I at know, right now but it's the fact that you can go to other Hebrew literature for other things and whatever's in that that key position in the different liturgies, is, yes. is important and that's the part it emphasizes that. that when you understand Hebrew you go oh that's really important so here is God at the center of the text, the creator, the author of our creation, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. But then it goes yeah. on to say there's two different parts of the presentation of God. Yeah. And we look at the word Elohim. And that, that word means three in one God. Elohim. We'll get that. Yeah. that. Well, you could uh, <laughs> if you want. Um, I don't know. I don't speak Hebrew ever, but, but Elohim. It makes him feel better, so it, we, it, we humor it, it, him. Indeed it is. You better do more. And so when we look at this, we look at the supremacy of God, but sometimes we get the idea, you know, that, that the other two parts of God, however you want to, to um, have them be, uh, sat back and go, go for it. Jesus, have a good time. <laughs> well, it wasn't Jesus well, yet. Just, I know, but what I'm saying is, you know, they're not sitting back. God God functions in everything uh, uh, as a three-in-one being. And that is really important for us to understand that three-in-one, that they are all in communion. They are all together, uh, a part of this creative process. Um, and that's in the very beginning part of Genesis 1.1. One, one. Lesson points out 1.1 one, yeah. one and 2 and verse 4 uses the word Elohim. There are many different names for God. And what's interesting here, and I wish I knew Hebrew so I could go and look because I do have a Hebrew, I do actually do have Hebrew scriptures. I got a copy at a library sale many years ago of a old Hebrew scriptures. But in any case, the lesson goes on to point out that in Genesis 2, verses 4 through 25, it talks about God who is personal and intimate. intimate. And then it uses the word Yahweh. Now, I'm trying to remember. I know the, the name Yahweh is not spoken by a good a person of Jewish faith because it's too sacred for our sinful mouths to speak even. Now, that's if you're Jewish. Um, because I was told I was a Gentile, I could say it and not be in trouble by a young Jewish student I had uh, when I taught in public school. But the name Yahweh, uh, the lesson points out that it's the name that we, people, scholars, I presume, believe denotes closeness and relationship. And yeah. that Yahweh intimacy is the God part, the God person. 
the God entity, whatever you want to be, the three and one, the one and three, who became Jesus and was born human. Yeah, and if you look at, um, I was, I want to go back and look at Genesis 2 and look at verse 4 specifically. My study Bible has a section that talks about this. Not only are the single names given, um, but they are compound ones as well. Some contend that use, the use of the different names in Genesis pre-support uh, multiple authorships that hold Moses must have drawn material from other sources, um, which used a different name, or me, he may have used different names himself. They don't know which one. But this is the part that's significant. El, Eloa, or the plural Elohim, all of which are translated God, imply the mighty one, the ruler over all created universe. Yahweh, the con, um, covenantal name of God of Israel, often, although enormous, uh, erroneously rendered Jehovah, uh, meaning he is, he is the covenant, uh, keeping God to the people according to Exodus. Anyway, he causes all things to be. That's really, when you're looking at it, the God of the covenant, he causes all things to be. Instead of reading the sacred name Yahweh, um, pious Israelites substituted the word Adonai, Lord, so that Yahweh is translated your Lord in King James Version and the Revised Standard Version. And that'll be a capital L and then lowercase capital letters O-R-D. That's you know it's talking about Yahweh or Jesus. Yes. Adonai meaning the Lord, emphasizing God's sovereignty as a king and... Um, Prince too small for her. She Elian even. signifying Most High and Shaddai the Almighty. Here, the compound Yahweh Elohim, Lord God, is used indicating the mighty creator of, the, of chapter 1 as the one who enters the covenant relationship with mankind. So when you put Yahweh and Elohim together, it is the Lord God. It is... The uh, single Adonai. most important, um, not just the creator God, but the one who enters the um, the covenant. And that is such an important part, I believe, of Genesis. Well, and and sp the, specifically, the lesson about creation. And of course, the covenant, the first covenant comes in Genesis 3, but that's not this week's lesson. But the fact that we see a twofold view of God in this portion of Genesis, the creation God, his majesty, his power, Elohim, and his closeness of assurance of proximity, forgiveness, and love in Yahweh. And that brings several references from Psalms also. The lesson has Psalms 95, 139, Psalm 2, and then also Revelation. So here we have... Throughout the entire Bible, I tell my students, you know, we everything we need to know about life is in the book of the Bible. The creation, everything that's happened in God's relation with man throughout from creation onward, and then Jesus' second coming, the destruction and recreation of the world again, and eternal harmony in in, in forever in the universe. And it's Revelation everything. fourteen seven is the one that really relates to that concept of, you know, the beginning and the end, and recognizing that God is God of the beginning and the end. And so, of course, it is the loud voice, right? Fear God. It's hard of hearing in heaven. Yeah, I am. Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is um, come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of the water. And so, again, recognizing God's creation, but also God's redemptive power. And that is a reason to fear him. And that fear, of course, is the awe worship, not be frightened. Yeah. Well, what a good segue into the creation, which is Monday's lesson. And unless you have a few more points you wanted to make there, dear, I saw you had your pointing to. Well, it's okay. Oh, no, we'll, just move, we'll just move on because I can say it next. 
It goes go to the right next ahead, one. Then. No, it goes to the next one. Then go right ahead. All right. So when we look at Genesis um, 1, it has 4, verse 4, verse 10, to, verse 12, verse 18, 21, uh, 25, 31. When you look at this, all those verses have the good. What is good? And what? why is God calling it good? Um, well, these are the today, ends of the days of creation. Yes, but I always tell the kids, the word good is a wimpy adjective. Except no, it's when a God, good one. No, except when, <laughs> except when God uses it. Then it is, it is all that is good. For most of us, we go, oh, I'm good. Well, oh, things are good. I'm but, fine. But you know, yeah. again, it's the word, our word good, the English translation of the Hebrew word, tov, I presume, T O V. And, uh, you know, again, if I wasn't so lazy, I'd learn Hebrew because this is such an important concept. That word, tov, or tov, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, meant successful. It worked. It did what it was supposed to do. Yeah. It's finished. Not just, yeah, it's good. Not nah, good enough, like Tracy's saying. Yeah. No, it's an adjective that God's work was successful. It worked. I love Genesis 1 4. It was light that illuminated. Oh, shall we be illuminated by the God Spirit in this? It worked. Everything, it did what it was supposed to do. The trees yielded fruit, the grasses yielded grain, and so forth. Things well, everything did was what working. supposed to exactly. Well, you know, today we know so much about the cell. I mean, just the individual cell. You, you can get down to molecule, and that's a whole other thing I don't get. But anyway, but the cell. The cell has three motors. No, you're talking about animal cells or plant cells. Doesn't matter. Oh, okay. All cells have three motors, and those three motors make the cell work. And all of them have to start. At the same moment. Simultaneously. Simultaneously. So here it throws out all of evolutionary theory that it's a progressive work. Because can't you can't happen. start one without the other. And none of them are going to start working without the power of God. Well, and not only that. But I the, think I've, the beginning of God starting. Them. And I think I've shared before the fact too for spontaneous lives to happen. So statistically, there, there is 36 billion. 36 billion comma, nine zeros after it. Events, concurrent, successive events that must take place before life happens. If any one of those 36 billion break down, the whole thing falls apart. Now, what's the chance? Yeah. It's, it's impossible just by pure statistical analysis. Yeah, so the so, efficiency of God in his creation, that he had, he could just speak and it would all start functioning, is such, I mean, the things that we know about you know, down to the smallest molecules. God Adam, had... Smaller than okay. molecules. All right. Subatomic particles, even smaller yet. Okay. So what he's saying, <laughs> as you look at that, that concept of, of not only creating something that works, but creating it down to its smallest, smallest form, is such a huge, huge thing. And God... It was working. Not just working, but it was working well. It was working perfectly. Not without well. evil, without sin. As it, you know, today, we know things work, you know. Um, <laughs> there are things in my body that work, and then sometimes I think, ooh, that didn't quite work like it used to. Um, we all have things around us that we know work. Um, whether it has to do with our garden, whether it has to do with our physical bodies, um, our brains, whatever it is, we know that sin has had an effect on this world. But when God created it, it's perfect. Okay, moving back to the word tov again. I didn't go on with finish with that. It not only does it mean it's finished and that it worked, but it also expresses aesthetic appreciation, the beauty in which God created it. We have no clue, no idea what it was like before the flood, before sin. And I'm sure even the few, I'm going to say a thousand or so years between creation and the flood. And I say that because Adam died before the flood and he was 960 years old. So 
you know, give or take a few years, that's a thousand. I think things probably did start to break down slightly. But the awesomeness, the beauty, the incredible, we, we, we can't begin to, to think what it, what it must have been like prior to the flood. But yet there it was. And Moses in his writing intentionally states by the use of his words that God created things intentionally and suddenly. Those three engines starting, boom, life, the cell. And God created it from every day prior, moving forward through the week to support the day that was new. Light first, then firmament, then land and water, and so forth, and uh, sun, moon, and stars, plants. Those plants needed light. They needed the sun, moon, and stars. Well, the sun, at least, for chlorophyll, chlorophyll to work. The animals that came next needed the water. The land animals needed dry land. They needed food. So, you know, it all was put together, one on top of the other. But, you know, is it the next lesson? No. At the end of the creation week, God didn't say it was good. Oh, that's later. It's okay. Well, maybe with creation and humanity. But in any case, he said it was very good. Yes. The superlative form yeah. of the adjective that we use. That's a whole different word in Hebrew, and we'll get there. We'll get there. So if we look at Genesis 1-3... Oh, you're going to do Barah now? Yes. Oh, okay. I kind of skipped over that, but she wants to do Barah. Okay. Go right ahead. So when we look at it, it means it's translated, and ah, it means I see. to create. Okay. To create. And Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the concept that God can create through his will and his word is a significant thing. Um, he... He can speak and it exists. That, that is, I think, one of the most important aspects for us to understand about creation. That when we talk about God's word, you know, we look at the Bible and we say this is God's written word. But we, when we understand that when God says it, it's real and it's true and it exists and he's created it, what has God said throughout the Bible? When God says it, it's, it's real. It exists. It is not anything within doubt. And that is something that when we go to Genesis um, 131 then, and it says, and God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and it was the sixth day. But that concept of, you know, where he spoke, and it, it was. Well, yes, except he didn't, well, we'll come back to that. I, the, six, the first five days of creation, God spoke, and things happened by his speech. And I, I don't know if the lesson said it. I don't remember back to Monday's part, if you got the word and will, or if that's from your own intellect but that's what a wonderful concept god creates by his word and by his will and it's very good yeah. well some creationists for some reason forget the the seventh day of creation they talk about a six day creation week no 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 it was a seventh day created week otherwise we'd because, be on a six day cycle right also because god created sabbath he had to create another day for it to exist Exactly. So right. there were seven days of creation. There just weren't objects of creation. Things created, exactly. But then again, a day was created, the seventh day. So I guess that's a thing. But well, there the weren't, time there was weren't, the thing. There weren't objects that were created like animals and plants and people and things like that. So yes, but the seventh day Sabbath. Well, I like to think that the first Sabbath, God took Adam and Eve on a trip to the zoo. And um, they got to go through the botanical gardens and named they... the animals by that, but sure, maybe they all came together in the zoo, made a zoo mm. for them in their worship. They could have sundown. everything in 24 hours. Sure, they could have. Okay. 
So when we look at the idea of God ending his, his work and then creating a day, another 24 hour evening and morning so that he could have time, time set aside because we know that God created man to work in the garden. He also that created was part time. of his. That's one thing we we miss in the fourth day of creation. We created sun, the sun, moon, and stars to rule the night and day, to set forth seasons and time. I think, but not daylight think, saving time. I think. I doubt there's any reference in Ellen White, and it's not one of the Bible, obviously. But that time is unique to Earth. I believe that. I don't believe that time is relevant anywhere else because every, everyone else in the in universe is immortal. So time is. That's why God could say, I am. He does not exist in time. Time is only here on earth. That's my idea. Take it for what it is. But God created a time, a special time, for his new creatures, human beings, and him to spend together. So I was thinking about my childhood. And when I was growing up, of course, I grew up in God's country, you know, Oregon. And when when you uh, are Oregonians, the whole world is I God's know, country. I know, but when you grow up in Oregon, <laughs> you're wet and soggy all the time. No. Um, <laughs> the as often as you possibly can, you get out into God's second book nature. And I think in our world today, we sometimes forget that. Um, last Sabbath, we went to see the poppies, and while they weren't the super bloom of a few years ago, it was still lovely to get out and. Um, look at the beautiful flowers and and talk to the little grandnieces about uh, the beauty of of God's nature and the different kinds of, of flowers that were blooming and um, you know just to watch them run the youngest one took off and she was a good quarter mile half no, mile. she wasn't she wasn't she was at least a quarter mile away. she wasn't more than 200 yards well maybe, anyway maybe she was on her way. Back she to was, Lancaster. She was almost too far away, yeah. but she was not that distant. But watching her run, just run. <laughs> just the joy of running out in nature. Um, it was just precious to watch because for her, it was like, look at this huge, wide open field. All I could think of was snake, snake, snake. But anyway, um, you know, just the joy of, of running in God's nature, just being in God's nature. Children need that so much. And, you know, as I've get, gotten older, I think, oh, I could just take a nice nap here in the sun. And um, that would be my enjoyment of God's nature. Uh, but getting out there and walking and seeing um, God's nature is uh, that very good creation uh, that he has given us. That's what our Sabbaths are for. And I think sometimes if we planned more, we would be more eager to get out into nature well, on Sabbath. I think if we perhaps were a bit more careful with our first other six days of the week and yeah. rested as we needed to during then, and I'm certainly guilty of not getting the rest that one needs. Americans suffer from lack of sleep more, I'm not going to say more than any other people, but we know by statistical research that Americans as a group are sleep deprived because, oh, four hours mm -hmm. is enough, five hours is enough. They're saying even adults need seven to eight hours of sleep. But in any case, if we were more rested and followed the clock that God set in place, sun up and sundown, we might have the energy come Sabbath to make it a day of recreation, recreation, recreation with God, yes, as opposed definitely. to a day of hiking to the box springs and taking a nap for two or three hours. But, you know, right in the middle of... Tuesday's lesson, page nine, your quarterly. I'd like to share a little paragraph with you. I'm sure you've read it, but I want to share it with you anyway. The Sabbath, which marks the first end in human, of human history, is also the sign of hope for suffering humankind and for the groaning of the world. It is interesting that the phrase, finish the work, reappears at the end of the construction of the sanctuary. It refers to Exodus 40 verse 33 and again at the end of the building of Solomon's temple 1st Kings 7 40 and 51 both places where the lesson of the gospel and salvation had been taught 
So we see Sabbath as a time where the lesson of salvation being taught. I'd like to think that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden in perfect beauty for longer than a week. Uh, hopefully for years before they got to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and blew it. And here we have it. You know, when you think, yes, Adam and Eve paid a price. Of course they did because they saw living 900 plus years what their choices did to the planet and to their, their family. We also are told that as each leaf fell and died, uh, died and fell off the tree, Adam and Eve grieved for it as if it was one of their own children. And then to have your one son kill another son? Oh goodness, Adam and Eve paid the price far more deeply than any of us have ever paid or will pay for their actions. They truly saw the horror of sin. The Sabbath is a sign of the end of our human week, and that is also is the sign of the end of suffering and trials of this world that we'll have at the end of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Each Sabbath points then to also the hope of our final redemption. Well, and that is from Isaiah 65. Which we have studied uh, earlier. Not very year. long ago. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And it looks at that concept, you know, and going to the end of that chapter, of course, is the promise, you know, the wolf and the lamb shall be together and um, that thus shall be the serpent's food and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. So recognizing that, you know, while there's a creation at the beginning, God's creative power will restore. And that's, I think, the promise of the Sabbath. It's a day for us to restore, to come back, to practice our worship all week. And then we get to Sabbath, and it's a special day for us to worship. We get to spend time with Him. We get to share in nature. We get to... Uh, share with our family and our church family. It's an opportunity um, to recreate what God wants us to practice all week long. And so whether you say that the week is practice for Sabbath or Sabbath is to remind us to practice all week, um, either way, it's a sign that um, eventually, in spite of all the woes that we have in this world, there will be an end. And God will end it and recreate. Now you mentioned about the week being a preparation for Sabbath. I read somewhere once that Jewish calendars don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They have sixth day of preparation for the Sabbath, fifth day of preparation for the Sabbath, fourth day, and so forth. Friday, of course, is the preparation day for the Sabbath, and then the Sabbath itself. So they tr it truly do prepare in the week ahead before Sabbath comes. And I almost think that Tuesday's and Wednesday's lessons were, should be reversed because Wednesday's lesson deals with the creation of humanity, which happens on the sixth day, and of course the Sabbath was the seventh day. But in any case, we have a whole day of the study this week, or last week I should say, for the, st the creation of humanity. Um, and as we look at Wednesday's lesson, but you're still on Tuesday's part. Are you looking at something you wanted? Yeah, to... I was looking at, at Luke 13, 13 to 16, oh, where it talks about... The um, healing and restoration on the Sabbath yeah. day, where Jesus did that, recorded several times yeah. in, the, in the Gospels. Where he, re, um, he, um, he restored healed, humanity. Uh, this, this woman in the synagogue, and of course they were like, six days thou shalt thou labor, but the seventh is set aside for worship. And his point is... Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he said this, and all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced in the glorious things that were done by him. 
set free on the Sabbath day. What a beautiful image. And that's really what he wants us to do is be set from each week. Let go of what you have. That's part of the rest that God um, offers us on the Sabbath day. Just let it go and come back. Come back to the creation. Well, Be jumping right. back a day to day six of creation, we see humanity being created. Mm -hmm. um, the earth was set for supporting life of every creature created previously. Mm -hmm. And now the culmination of the creation week of creatures, we have humanity. A unique creation in the in the world and the universe. Some people think, and I, I've heard that it's supported by Ellen White comments, but I've never come across it that humanity was supposed to replace the angels that Satan took with him from heaven, and being special friends for God. But in any case, go, prior to the creation of humans, in which God said. Let us make man in our own image. And the lesson spends quite a bit of time about the words that were used in the Hebrew in about our image, which takes kind of a part. One of my ideas, and I'm glad that now I know it's supported by the Bible. I don't need to, to worry about my idea, but I have a little twist on the end I like to keep. But that humans being a special creature, God does not speak humanity into being. God touches. He uses physical contact. He shapes Adam from the, from the dust of the earth, from the soil, from the earth itself. We are part of the earth. And because of that, unfortunately, there was the thought back in the early 20th century that because humans were of the earth, they could do anything to destroy the earth. But yet the lesson points out that one of the three things we were charged to do was to take care of the earth. Mm -hmm. So obviously we didn't do our job and haven't been doing our job very well. But, but the fact that God chose now not to speak this new creature into being, but to touch, to form, to to bring forth. And then what's he do to create the life of the being? It says he breathed the breath of life. Well, one Bible scholar says that breath is with a kiss, a kiss of love, divine love to bring this new being to life. What a more intimate relationship can God and man have? So here we see that breath of life, the nifresh, Nefesh, rather, uh, where God formed and breathed. The breath of life refers to the spiritual dimension of humanity, and, and that's what goes back to God when we die, our, our life force, so to speak. But when he created in God's image, the Hebrew word uh, sele, selem, I think, T-S-E-L-E-M, it's right in the middle of page 10. The image refers to the concrete shape of the physical body. And then also the word uh, demule. Demute. The, that's a T. Uh, I circled it. D E M U T. And, and, and cut my circle, I cut off the letter. So, okay. Uh, demute or demute. The likeness refers to the abstract qualities that, co that compare us to divinity, our character, our soul, our being. So, I guess God has. Two eyes, two ears, a nose, and a mouth. Well, okay, a physical resemblance. In Education, page 15, Ellen White says, he bore his physical, mental, and spiritual nature, a likeness to his maker. And referring so, to Adam. Yeah. Eve. And so when we look at that, that, that idea that, um, you know, and, and when we look at the beginning of what was said there, um, let us let us make man in our image. And, so, and I understand we would that bear word, us, as translated, is a unique word for the Trinity. Elohim. Oh, that's Elohim? Elohim. Oh, okay. I thought that was yes. a different word altogether No, it's there. the plural Elohim. Well, I know that. And it looks at the concept that um, all, all aspects of God. So 
the aspects we attribute to the Holy Spirit, the aspects that we um, we um, uh, often uh, attribute to Christ um, as he created, and the Father who, um, you know, is, is a part of that might and power. When we look at all of those things, that was part of what God created in man, and it would set man aside as a rational, thoughtful, um, creative being that could um, not only be the image of God, but then recreate that um, throughout, uh, well, originally eternity. And, and there, again, too, I think part of the uniqueness of, of human creatures is we could create, well, procreate life, as opposed to God creating life. But one part, you know, Jesus, God the Son, looks Middle Eastern, probably dark hair and dark eyes. He took on human, humanity's form, and he will retain that forever. But I think God the Father is like water. And you're going to say, wait, he's liquid? No, 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 no. Water reflects. So I think, when we get to heaven... Yeah, this is his philosophy. Who, it's not philosophy, it's an idea. Who is looking at God will see. I'll see him with blue eyes and blonde hair. Yes, my hair was blonde. And lighter skin. Yet where someone who has African-American heritage, or, or African heritage, who's darker complected, will see God that way. Whereas a Native American with the tanner skin, the dark eyes, dark hair, they'll see him that way and so forth. God is all to everyone. So he'll look like everyone. Well, and really, the, I think the most important aspect of, of this part of creation and the point was that God, God made us in, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the physical image but I think that the important aspect is that God was willing to create us free choice. Well, all human, his creatures are that way. The angels are that way too. Free choice human beings with the rational ability to be one with him. And that intimacy, that, that expectation that we would be one with him um, was significant in the creation of humanity. And there are aspects of that, that that are very singular to humanity that other created beings will not know. So when we look at Thursday's lesson... It deals with what took place after the creation week where God charged Adam and Eve yeah. with their job, so to speak. Or, and that came... And that changed after the fall their responsibilities and duties changed. It became much more laborious, laborious, I guess is the word I want, not laborious. Get the accent on the right syllable there. Uh, page 11, Thursday's lesson mentions or brings to the point that God gave humankind three gifts at humanity. He gave them in the garden three gifts. The first refers to the work we had to do, avad. The second one had to do with what we eat, it was a gift. God gave us a gift. The food was there for us. We didn't make it. It was there. Eat, a, eat freely of, of every seed, grass, and fruit-bearing plant. Uh, and then the last part, the last part, of course, is the duty to each other. The duty of husbands and wives. And we'll touch on each one of those as we go through this portion of the lesson. So if we look at Genesis 2 and go to verse 15 to 17. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded, meaning the three in one, by the way, uh, commanded the man saying, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you will die. You shall die. So shall be important. Tracy jumped over a little bit there of the first duty of man, but that's the first lesson, the uh, first big read in the lesson, but it's probably through the day itself. 
and the point here is eat whatever you want, eat freely, except for this. And I never thought, as the lesson points out, that humans were given that gift. And But they said, there's a slight restriction. You can't have everything, but you can have everything except this one thing. Now, sometimes people think, oh, how, how, how arbitrary of God. Well, wait, they had probably thousands of things to choose from. And, oh, just this one, leave it alone, leave it alone. So the lesson points out that, and I'm going to quote here. I'm probably okay, gonna say you're two. jumping ahead, but it's Well, okay. no, you brought it up with 2.15, okay, okay. because at the top there, in the middle rather than the top, enjoyment without restriction leads to death. Wow. So that, you know, searching for total free love of the 60s led to all kinds of diseases and issues. Okay. Anyway. So if we go back, we often skip this middle part of Genesis 2. And I think it's really important because it's about, um, you know, God had created this earth. And God had planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put man where he had formed out of the ground. And um, that it was pleasant to sight and good for food and tree of life in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there was divided became four rivers. Of course, uh, Bishon, um, the one that flows through the whole land of Halavah. Uh, where there's gold, and the gold of the land is good. The little, um, and anyway, it goes on. And then the second river, um, Gion, uh, which is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush, and the name of the third river, ah, Tigris, mm -hmm. and then the fourth, Euphrates. So today, you know, a lot of times people go, well, there's not really a lot of history that goes with Genesis. But there is a lot of history that goes with Genesis and a lot of geography. And if we recognized how important that is, sometimes God created this big world and we focus on this much of it. And she was we, doing that, by the way. You couldn't see because she did her hands like this. It's just a teeny bit of it um, because that's where all the action happened. It's like the <laughs> stage of the world. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that that God, when he said, this one tree, it wasn't just like, we're going to Disconso Garden and there's one tree I want you to stay away from. We're talking in the entire world where they could go and where there were created things all over this big old place. So there probably were tens of thousands of trees from which they could eat. Oh, Maybe probably, more than that even. Yeah, millions. And yet... It's this one right here in this garden. This is the only one out of all those other things. And plus there were other things to eat besides things from trees as well. So it wasn't... Yeah. It really was minute in its existence. But the whole concept of that tree was truly about God's grace. Meaning, he had created a whole world for our pleasure for our enjoyment, for our benefit, for food, for for work, for all the things that he had created humanity to enjoy. And he said, this one test, and I think somehow we want to think, well, that was the bad tree. <laughs> but it was just as good as any other tree. It was just there as a test of their willingness to follow his direction. And that's the part, when we think about it, you know, if it had been an ominous tree where things were dead and rotting and whatever, they would have probably been shocked. But it looked just like every other tree. It looked just like every other fruit. Why, in fact, it's right next to one that's okay. Or close by, at least. And that's the part that we sometimes forget. That Adam and Eve had this whole beautiful world. They could follow the rivers. They could go places. They could see this massive earth that God had created. And, yeah, they struggled. 
at the end of this page, you will see that um, they talk a little bit about the, the duty of man, that third gift, that he shall leave his, the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife. Um, that concept of, of having an intimate partner was so important to God. Um, and that's, that's what Satan has sought to destroy in our world today. Can we destroy what God created as a beautiful, intimate relationship? And at the end, the very best, God's crowning creative yeah. uh, work, creation of humanity. Yeah. That and he did a very good job flesh. right off the bat. Did a very yeah. good job right off the bat. Uh, Cain killed Abel. Yeah. Breaking apart the family destroying that concept but our responsibility to each other it res it it is part of God's plan not just in the marriage but our responsibility is to each of us being humankind but in particular that bond the of bond marriage. of marriage a gift that as it says entails human responsibility once the gift has been received the responsibility rests with both man and woman to fulfill it faithfully Again, enjoying without restriction leads to death. Going back up, he created work for us to do, to keep the garden. The word the, that the verb used in, he, uh, in Hebrew is shamar, which is the responsibility to preserve and protect. Hmm. We've done that in national parks and world heritage sites, but not globally very well. And then, of course, he gave us work to occupy. Well, we come to the end of the lesson, Friday's lesson. Long quotes and uh, from the story of redemption and uh, book of education. But it all talks about how the Bible and nature support each other. Biblical and natural evidences of creation support one another. And the God fact is... that we know, like we mentioned earlier, to, down to the cellular level... Creation had to happen. It could not have been random and spontaneous and evolving. Well, and that's the important aspect, I think, of going back and looking at creation again. God is allowing us to learn so much about the human mind, about the human body, about just how things work in our, in our world, what's working, what isn't. I think shedding light, more and more light, on the beauty of his creation and the fact that we're not paying a bit of attention to that. And how, how, for lack of a better word, degenerative it has become over the six or 7,000 years, uh, as the biblical history shows, from what it was? Oh, goodness. One thing that is going to be amazing is on the resurrection morning, as we call it, when we see those resurrected who lived before the flood, grand of stature, as Ellen White talks about Adam, who towers above other humanity, Wow, how amazing that day will be. Yeah. And the Sabbath points to that resurrection, to that restoration, to that, that bringing humanity back in atonement, at one moment with God. And we can do that every Sabbath. Father, thank you. Thank you for creation. Thank you for the lessons learned about you, your creative power, but more about the relationship that you want with us. I ask that you care for us in a way that we will be able to respond. You know our hearts, you know our longings, you know what we need. And I pray that you will fulfill that today and recreate in us your image so that when you come, we can go home. We long to go home. We're done here. We, we want to be with you. And we ask that we will live this week remembering that that's our, our, our goal, to live with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you for lesson two of this new quarter.